our two speakers tonight, uh, I'm sure you know, don't really need much of an introduction. Um, the first speaker will be Alan Woods, editor of Marxist.com and author of Bolshevism, The Road to Revolution. And our second speaker will be Orlando Fijas, who, will be, who uh, is a professor of history at Birkbeck, University of London, and uh, author of A People's Tragedy. Um, so without further ado, I will invite Alan to speak. No matter what you think, about the Russian Revolution of 1917, there can be no dispute that it was one of the greatest events in human history, an event which radically changed the course of world history. And funnily enough, although you might think this is an historical subject, after all, it took place a long time ago, not in the in emptiness, yes? Funnily enough, it's an event which still provokes, and I think we'll see this, this, I hope we'll see this this evening, enormous heat and emotion and passion. And that's not an accident. Because in discussing these events, we are not discussing Egyptian mummies or fossils in the museum. We're not discussing the events of 1917. We're discussing the situation now and the problems faced by the human race now. And what solution must be, must be found to these problems? Now, and furthermore, what is our role in solving these events? Now, the first, my first word is a word of warning. Precisely for that reason, do not expect any kind of impartial, academic, objective, scientific analysis of this question, which rises above party politics or class interests. Your attitude towards the Russian Revolution will be determined ultimately by which class interests you choose to defend. In the 19th century, the great Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle, when he was about to write something about the life of Oliver Cromwell, the English Revolution. Oh yes, we had, an Engl we had a revolution here a few centuries ago which cut off a king's head. And that was a big step forward. That is what uh, created the conditions for political democracy in this country and in France, where they also resorted to even more drastic measures, shall we say. Also it was necessary in order to drag France out of feudal backwardness and absolutist oppression. Nothing new, therefore. But when, when, Oliver, when, when, when uh, Thomas Carlyle attempted to get at the truth about Oliver <coughs> Cromwell, he said the following. Before I could approach the role of Oliver Cromwell, I first had to drag his dead body out from underneath a mountain of dead dogs. The lies, the slanders, the bile, the calumny, the spite of the ruling class towards revolutionaries, that's not new. That's a constant feature. I will add something to that. You see, it is never enough for the ruling class to defeat a revolution. That's not enough. They must ensure that the very memory of the, uh, the, the historical events are buried, as Carlyle said, under a heap of dead dogs. In order, for what purpose? Well, for a very clear, it's not an academic purpose. It is not, it is emphatically not for the purpose of historical clarification or scientific evaluation. No, 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 no. It is to prevent the young people of today understanding what really occurred in the Russian Revolution and therefore from taking the same road. The line is, and it's a consistent line, hammered in, day in, day out, becomes almost monotonous. It's don't touch revolution, because revolutions always end badly. And therefore, the conclusion, the PS is, accept things as they are. Accept the status quo. <coughs> That's the real message behind this. This message has been quadrupled, has been multiplied by a hundredfold, particularly over the last 20 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The greatest event, the greatest single event in human history. Why do I say this? Well, for this reason. For this reason, that here 
for the first time in history, if we exclude that glorious but uh, brief episode of the Paris Commune, here for the first time, the masses, that uh, somewhat misused, frequently overused word, by which I mean millions of ordinary men and women, not members of political parties, not necessarily, not cadres, not developed margin, ordinary working class men and women, workers, peasants, and so on, young people, students, succeeded in overthrowing a monstrous regime of oppression. Let no one be under any doubts on that question. The czarist regime was the regime of the most monstrous oppression imaginable. And at least started the task. Yes, at least one has to give them that merit. At least commenced the great historical task of the socialist transformation of society. You know, the fact that that uh, mission did not succeed, ultimately it failed, and we can explain the reasons for that, does not take away any merit from these people. The story is that Lenin, with a tiny group of conspirators, this man, <coughs> The tiny group of succeeded, we don't know how, perhaps someone will explain it to us, succeeded in, in, in carrying out a revolution behind the backs of 150 million people and overthrowing a powerful regime with a huge army, a huge police force, huge resources, and by the way, they were even underground for, for, for quite a long time during the period of February and October. Now, I, the first question I must ask, maybe Orlando can... can and enlighten me, is how, by what means of, of black magic was this feat accomplished? And if you're able to enlighten me, Orlando, I'd be delighted to hear your explanation because then tomorrow morning I will undertake to take power in Britain immediately. <laughs> you know. Okay, now, if you like. <laughs> well, you, you, you will tell me later. But in any case, if you're able to enlighten me, I'll take power tomorrow. It is arrant nonsense. It is a fairy story, and the purpose of a fairy story, of course, is to lull the baby to sleep. And it's only of interest to, to babies if it comes. Well, it, it's, it's an explanation that, as a matter of fact, it corresponds to a very unscientific historical approach, which is the conspiracy theory of history. That's what it boils down to. The conspiracy theory of history. An explanation which explains precisely nothing. It's the same prejudice, by the way, as you see in, reactionary, in the reactionary press, whenever there's a strike, the workers have got a genuine grievance. And the argument is always, oh, no, no, this is caused by communist agitators, by reds. When in point of fact, the, the, the whole struggle is determined by objective factors which need to be explained. So the conspiracy theory, my friend, explains precisely nothing. It's a little bit insulting to the intelligence even to raise a question of that character. Revolution, you know, is a process. It isn't a one-act drama at all. The Russian Revolution, well, you could argue, it began even in 1905, but let's stick to 1917. Took place over a period of nine months, from February to October, and all kinds of events <coughs> took place in, in the course of that. If you want to really understand what took place, and above all, if you want to understand the most salient fact, which I'm going to emphasize and stress and insist upon, despite all that's said to the contrary, the Russian Revolution of 1917 was the most popular and the most democratic revolution in history, with the greatest participation of the masses. The, the whole secret of the Russian Revolution, from February on, it's precise, it's more to force, was not the machinations of this or that group. It is precisely the, the massive entrance into the, the stage of history of the masses. By the way, that's how you define the revolution. The two books which I strongly recommend you to read is one written by an American eyewitness called John Reed, Ten Days That Shook the World, a marvelous little book, and another rather larger work, which in my opinion is the definitive historical work on the Russian Revolution by one of the main leaders and one of the most prominent Marxist theoreticians of all time, Leon Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. Please read it. I guarantee that you will you'll find it an eye-opener. What these books, and not just those books, what, what many, many, many other eyewitnesses accounts, Suhanov, you name it, it the, the demonstrates precisely that it was the mass movement that was the decisive element from start to finish in this marvelous revolution. But of course, it went through phases. When the masses overthrew, when the workers and soldiers overthrew the Tsar 
in February, there was, no, there was nobody leading that. The Bolshevik Party was very small, as a matter of fact. Not more than about 8,000 members in a country of 150 million. So that's very small. Yes, a small minority. But how did this small minority become transformed into a decisive force, a big party capable of leading, consciously leading millions of workers and peasants to the seizure of power in the space of nine months? A, a political transformation, by the way, which I don't believe has got any parallel whatsoever in, in history. And the basic answer, it's not possible to go into details, but the basic answer is this. The Russian bourgeoisie, the Russian bourgeois liberals, who rose to the surface after the overthrow of the Tsar, were organically incapable of carrying out the necessary task, necessary for the masses, for the work, precisely for the millions of people that we are talking about. What were these necessary tasks? They were summed up in a, a slogan of genius put forward by Lenin as soon as he came back to Russia, addressing himself precisely to, the, to these masses that he was supposed to be conspiring against. Peace, bread, land. Yes, and in order to carry that out, all power to the Soviets. In their origin, necessary. in 1905, when PS. they appeared, all that the Soviets were were extended strike committees, that's all, where there were no, no legal, <coughs> Tsarist Russia, my friends, no legal trade unions, no legal political parties. If you opposed that regime, you were in jail if you were lucky. Not, and therefore the workers in, in 1905, when they staged a general strike against the, the Tsarist regime for democracy, for democratic demands, organized themselves spontaneously from below, and I can't emphasize that idea too strongly, from below, it shows the creativity of the working class, not ignorant people or stupid people, as more than one bourgeois historian tries to depict them, but the creativity of ordinary people who created this, the Soviets, extended strike committees in order to carry through the strike. The same Soviets re reappeared spontaneously in February, but what is happening? Sabotage. <laughs> I think we have a counter-revolution here tonight, uh, Orlando. In the chair, that is, not yourself. Uh, <laughs> what does I say? It spontaneously reappeared with, with this difference, that it, not just the workers were, were represented, but the soldiers, this was during a bloody war. By the way, if you just read the history of the First World War, where millions of people were slaughtered in the muck and the filth and the blood, the, the blood and the poison gas of the trenches, and Russia suffered more than most. Uh, the, the soldiers joined the, the Soviets, which was a decisive factor. And after a period of, of struggle, they overthrew the, the government. The Tsar was forced to, to abdicate. And a government was proclaimed called the Provisional Government, dominated by the, uh, first of all, by the bourgeois liberals, and then subsequently joined by the, the Mensheviks and Social Revolutionaries, which are the Russian reformers, or if you like, to be a little bit unkind, the Russian uh, Ed Milibands. Uh, organized the provisional government. But for a period of nine months, you see, the workers didn't stage this revolution just for the sake of it. What they were demanding is, that, first of all, an end to the war. This monstrous war had to end. Secondly, they were, the peasants wanted the land. Thirdly, the ordinary people, the women in particular, played a colossal role in the revolution. Women actually led the revolution in the first instance. Bread for their families. Not an unreasonable program, I think. And yet, in the course of nine months, the Russian bourgeois liberals and the reformists were unable to carry out a single one of those demands. Not one of them would carry out. That, my friends, and that alone, is the reason why the Bolsheviks, in a period of nine months, succeeded in winning what? In winning the majority. You know, that's called democracy in my book. Look, let's, let's spell it out in words that a child of six can understand. There's absolutely no way and no possibility of Marxists posing the question of taking majority, uh, of taking control of society unless you have a majority, at least a decisive majority of the working class. That's the fundamental task. That was achieved in Russia, not by black magic, not by conspiracy, but by open agitation, propaganda, and work. Let's have some proof of this. If I can find the place, there's probably I cannot. Well, first of all, no, I, I, you, you, forgive me, you forgive me, Orlando, because he did have some good, good stuff in this book, by the way. I'll give him that uh, credit. Uh, he wrote the following. The, this is Orlando speaking. 
the Menshevik party had practically ceased to exist in Petrograd by the end of September, correct? The last all-city party conference was unable to meet for lack of a quorum. Orlando uh, Fidges, correct, correct. The better case, and this is quite conclusive, is by an enemy of the Bolshevik party, a Menshevik by the name of Sukhanov, who wrote a very interesting history of the revolution, eyewitness account. He wrote the following, let me quote with your permission. Describing in the last days of September 1917, he said the following. Right? The Bolsheviks were working stubbornly and without let up. They were among the masses, among the masses, yes, well, this is a Menshevik speaking. They were among the masses at the factory benches every day without pause. Tens of speakers, big and little, were speaking in Petersburg, in the factories, and in the barracks every blessed day. For the masses, get a load of this. For the masses, this is a Menshevik speech. For the masses, they had become their own people. Is that clear? I think it's fairly clear. Because they were always there, taking the lead in details as well as in the most important affairs in the factory barracks. They had become the sole hope, indeed. The sole hope. The mass, this is how he finishes, the mass lived and breathed together with the Bolsheviks. I think that's fair to say. Written by an enemy of the Bolshevik party, Sukhanov, a leader, a leading Menshevik. And therefore the whole argument falls to the ground. It flies in the face of the historical record, the facts, the accounts, and so on and so forth. Another argument which is often is, ah yes, but what about the bloodshed? What about the violence? What about the checker? What about this? What about that? Well, you see, the question is this. I might surprise you here. The actual seizure of power, the insurrection, and you must distinguish between the, the insurrection, which is the act of taking power, and the whole of the nine months period which went before, without which you can't understand the insurrection, okay, was indeed carried out by a minority. Uh, there was, let me surprise you, in Petrograd, at least, the Bolshevik revolution was virtually peaceful. There was hardly any bloodshed. I'll quote a, a little anecdote to, to demonstrate the point. Ten years after the Russian revolution, 1927, Sergei Eisenstein, the great Soviet film director, uh, made a film called October. It's a marvelous film. If you don't know it, you should watch it. Marvelous. It's marvelous cinema, but its history leaves something to be desired. And in the course of this film, there's a famous scene called the, 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 the capture of the Winter Palace. You see all kinds of people, uh, red soldiers and so on, climbing up the gates, throwing bombs, firing guns, falling down dead and so on. Let me tell you something. More people were killed making that film than were killed when they seized the Winter Palace. There was an, an, an unfortunate accident, which if you look at the film, it's not surprising. <laughs> they must have had a lot of gunpowder around. A few actors were killed. Nobody was killed in the seizure of the Winter Palace. Again, uh, Orlando uh, makes the same point. I just pass that sheet of paper, please, Orlando. I'm quoting you, so you shouldn't object. Oh, no, that's not, that's not the right bit of paper. Anyway, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Orlando made the point that the, the, the famous seizure of the Winter Palace, in point of fact, was, was no, nothing to do with that. Because they surrendered. Nobody was killed when they seized the Winter Palace. When they fired the, 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 the... What I'm saying is this, and by the way, it's not true that Lenin advocated violence and civil war. On the contrary, for the whole of the nine months, he was arguing in the Soviets to the Russian Ed Miliband. Look, please take the power. That's the meaning of all power in the Soviets. Look, we're a minority. We know we're a minority. Why don't you guys take power, have peace, bread, and, that, and then we will guarantee... He said this many times, many times. We will guarantee that the struggle for power will be reduced to a peaceful debate inside the Soviets. The problem was that the Russian Mensheviks and social revolutionaries refused to take power. They were in a block with the liberals. They refused to break with the liberals. They had no power. They had no confidence in the workers. Orlando makes the point very well in his book, I must say, that they were terrified of the masses. Both the liberals and the, the uh, reformers were terrified of the masses. That's the truth of the matter. And therefore, they, 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 they were not able to act in this way. Only one party, the Bolsheviks, maintained consistently, we stand for the transfer of power to the Soviets immediately and <coughs> peace, bread, and land also for the year. That is, the, is this rocket science? Is this so difficult to understand how they got power? I don't think it's so difficult. That's the reason I'm explaining to you. 
What about the violence? Well, you know, the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, at least in Petrograd, was a peaceful affair. I've, I've said that. Then it was never advocating. Where there was a real bloodbath, and it was a terrible bloodbath, was subsequently, the moment that the Bolsheviks took power, they were faced with armed revolts, mutinies, counter-revolutionary uprisings in the provinces, and they were invaded. I think you under underestimate this for the fact that you book, if I might say so. They were invaded by 21 foreign armies of intervention, British, French, Czechs, Germans, Austrians, Poles, Japanese, Romanians, you name it. Now, in a situation like that, and by the way, faced with the most ferocious violence, what are you supposed to do? I suppose you could read the Sermon of the Mount to the, to the, to the fascist counter revolution so that's what they were. They were fascists, Russian fascists, specialized in murdering in pogrom, in, in Jews in pogroms. You say, oh no, turn the other cheek, non-violence. This is just stupidity. I'm afraid, you see, I'm not a violent person by any manner of means, but I'll say this. If you are faced with, a, with an aggression, you have the right to defend yourself or not. And they did defend themselves. Trotsky organized the Red Army for nothing, Army of Workers and Peasants. And by the way, let's go back to this question of a coup. If it is true that it was a small conspiracy which was unrepresentative, how the hell did they hold power for four years afterwards in the course of this civil war? I think that uh, Orlando knows the answer. It's in his book. But the mass of the peasants understood that the Bolsheviks were the only ones that would give them the land. And that behind the, the, the white armies, there were the old landowning class uh, waiting to take the land back. And therefore, they, they fought. And finally, oh, there was another reason. Not the Czechic, by the way, which played a, a subordinate role. The real reason was that the Bolsheviks pursued a, a revolutionary war, making a propaganda to the troops in their own language, to the British, to the French, with the result Every single one of the foreign armies had mutiny, mutinied and were forced to withdraw. That's a big part of, of the reason why they could say. But why this e e exaggerated stress on violence and violence? Look, he killed people. Then he was a violent man, which he was not, by the way. All this uh, business took place. Okay. You know, if you know anything about history, history is full of examples of peasant, of slave revolts. Many of them. All of them were defeated. And when the slaves rose up and were defeated, they were mercilessly crushed by the ruling class, by the landlords, the bosses, the capitalists. When Spartacus was defeated, the Roman ruling class crucified thousands of slaves all along the Via Appia as a warning to the slaves. Don't even think about it. You slaves, slaves you will remain. When the Paris Commune was defeated, was drowned in blood, in 1871, 30,000 men, women, and children were, were slaughtered by the whites, by the Versailles, with the Catholic Church, of course, up the, up the head. You know the difference here? I'll tell you what the difference is. Here in Russia, for the first and only time, the <coughs> slaves fought back and they won. That's the crime for which they cannot be forgiven, which Trotsky and Lenin cannot be forgiven. Nothing else. Oh, violence. Oh, look, they killed a lot of people. Oh, yes. What about Winston Churchill in the who ordered the firebombing of Dresden with slaughtered hundreds of thousands, burnt alive hundreds of thousands? That's okay. That violence is okay. Or Harry Truman ordered the, drop, the dropping of an atom bomb on two quite uh, useless military targets, Hiroshima and Hiroshima, and again killing a mass of people in the most atrocious way. That's okay. Or even, here's an interesting example, Abraham Lincoln, you know, the American Civil War, the second American Revolution, there were more people killed than in the Russian Civil War per head of the population. Check the figures. But nobody ever says to me, oh, how terrible, how could he kill all these people? Look, it's not just if... Nobody ever asked me these questions. Only in relation to the Bolsheviks are they singled out for this quite dishonest and hypocritical attack here. Incidentally, warfare is about killing people. You know that? It's a, it's a regrettable fact. In war, people get killed. This is a fact. Finally, because I don't have much time, what is the balance sheet of October? Well, I've already said the most important thing, but at least for the first time in history, the masses succeeded in overthrowing a monstrous tyranny and at least beginning the task of transforming society. Admittedly, they did so in an extremely backward country. How backward? People forget this. How backward? Let me just quantify it for you. 
You know how many industrial workers there were in Tsarist Russia in 1970? Less than four million, I think. Industrial workers, you include other f factors, miners and transport. Not more than 10 million, I think, in the whole of Russia. A country of 150 million people. Now think, we are talking about a country more backward than Pakistan today. Get your heads around that. And yet on the basis of a socialist planned economy, yes, with all the crimes of Stalinism and all the rest of it, and yes, it's true, I don't disagree with that. Despite all these things, they succeeded in, in, in one thing, they did succeed in. What was that? The Russian Revolution proved, not in the language of dialectics or the three volumes of capital, but in the language of steel, cement, space power, and so on, they proved one thing, that it is possible, it is possible, to run a vast country of 150 million people, one-sixth of the Earth's surface, without private bankers, capitalists, and landlords, and yes, get excellent results. Because they did get excellent results for a whole series of years. I've got the figures here. I don't have time to give them. I'll probably give them in the summing up, but you better believe it. Alec Norves, a prominent uh, economic historian, said, world history knows nothing like this. The transformation of what was an extremely backward country. I'll just take one example, if I may. 60 or 70 percent of the people of Russia in 1970 could neither read nor write. They were illiterate. The Soviet Union established uh, a situation where, when I was studying in 1970, studying in the Moscow State University, Russia had more scientists than Britain, America, Japan, and Germany put together, and they were excellent scientists. I will finish. I'll give the figures perhaps in my summing up, just to, to, to show that it's not just uh, an empty statement. But just to say this, I will finish. When the Soviet Union finally collapsed in 19, when was it? 20 years ago, approximately. Uh, this guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, in, in America. Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama said, it's the end of history. Not just the end of socialism, the end of Marxism, the end of communism, but the end of history, quote unquote. Well, 20 years have passed, not such a long time in the course of history. History is not finished. The, 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 the wheel has turned full circle, and now it is capitalism, which is in its deepest crisis for 200 years, with all the horrors which that entails for this uh, planet. And we have to decide, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to accept this monstrosity? Or, like the Bolsheviks, are you going to enter into a struggle against it? If you, as I hope, take the latter option, then you will find that merely fighting is not enough. You have to have a clear idea a clear strategy, a clear program. And to my uh, way of thinking, to my, to my consent, con uh, contention, I'll, I'll finish on that, the only idea that can really lead us to, 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 to changing society successfully is the ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. And therefore, for us, the Russian Revolution is not something that's finished and, and done with. It's the present, it's the future, it's our, it's our hope, and it's our inspiration. Thank you. Alan, when were you at Moscow University? I didn't know. 1970. 1970. They must have brainwashed you. It felt like listening to this uh, professor I had at Moscow University when I was there as a graduate student in the 1980s who talked exactly like you in the same myths, distortions, and above all, slogans. We heard a lot of slogans. We didn't hear much detail. I'll give you some of the detail, and I hope by the end of it you'll realise that Alan's very fine speech is tosh. You talk about the balance sheet of the October Revolution. You didn't say very much about the period after this civil war supposedly imposed on the Bolsheviks, and I'll come to that, because it wasn't simply imposed on them, it was invited by the Bolsheviks as integral to their revolution. But you don't go much beyond that. And if we look at the balance sheet and count the millions who died from terror, not just under Stalin but under Lenin, who died from famine, man-made famine in 1921, man-made famine in 1932-4, to four, Man-made famine in 1946 to 8. And we count the millions who died or were uprooted as a result of collectivization. 
And we count the millions who died from the way the Bolsheviks decided to fight the great patriotic war, another slogan, because they fought that war in a way which is and was condemned by Soviets at the time as inexcusable. The rush to Berlin, kill a few more to get there quicker. When you add up all those victims, is it no wonder that nobody in Russia today talks as you do? Nobody, apart from a few old age pensioners with their medals, still has any nostalgia for the dreams you've just given us. You should be ashamed of yourself talking like that. Read some books. Go into the archives where I have worked for 25 years and found out some details of this dream you've just spun. I can go into the details of each one of those waves of terror and atrocity and mass killing in greater detail if you want. But let's wind the clock back to October where were the peace, the bread, the land. Land? For a while, but it wasn't given to the peasants by the Bolsheviks. It was taken by the peasants willy-nilly. They would have taken it anyway. They'd been taking it since February. They needed no Lenin's decree, which was copied, actually, on the basis of Soviet mandates written for the peasants by the socialist revolutionaries, those supporters of Ed Miliband you supposedly denounce. But, within a few years... And certainly by the late 1920s, the peasants are being deprived of the land, deprived of their own labour product on the land in collectivisation. So, so much for land. What about the bread? There was so little bread because of requisitioning and the war on the peasantry forcing the bread producers into a war against the Bolsheviks. No support for the Bolsheviks' requisitioning squads, I'm sorry, and you miss quote me and distort my argument on the civil war. They only supported the Bolsheviks because they were terrified of losing the land to the whites. That's what I said. But no support for the Bolsheviks. Indeed, as soon as the whites are defeated, the peasants are up in arms against the Bolsheviks. And they were up in arms against the Bolsheviks in 1918 when they first come with their violent requisitioning squads, raping women and children, burning villages to get the grain off the peasants. And so the peasants withdraw. They hide their grain. And in the cities there's no bread. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of townsmen take anything they can loot out of their factories, take it in bags to go and trade and barter with the peasants. <coughs> so where's this working class, these masses you talk about? The Bolsheviks themselves were talking about the disappearance of the working class by the spring of 1918. Workers in every single stronghold of the Bolsheviks in 1917 were up in arms in strikes and protests against the Bolsheviks by the spring of 1918. Way before the Kronstadt mutiny of 1920 to 21 or the workers' strikes of that time when they were all denouncing the Bolshevik dictatorship. You mentioned Trotsky and his history of the revolution. I've just mentioned the Kronstadt sailors, the pride and glory of the Russian revolution. Do you remember that part of the history? Yes, yes of course. July 4th, the Kronstadt <laughs> sailors outside the Torai Palace wanting to seize power. Trotsky telling them no. And when Chernov goes out to plead with the Kronstadters to go home, and the Kronstadters manhandle Chernov, the socialist revolutionary, Trotsky tells them, the Kronstadt sailors, that they are the pride and glory of the Russian Revolution. But they must not take out their anger in acts of violence against individuals. So they lay off Chernov. Four years later, those very same sailors because people have gone into archives and found out they were more or less exactly the same individual people, those very same sailors are rising up in rebellion against the Bolshevik dictatorship, as they call it. No bread, no land, and no peace. Yes, the Bolsheviks called an armistice. Yes, 
They negotiated the so-called shameful peace with the Germans, which meant that they had to give up most of their industrial base, a lot of their population. And no Bolshevik would go to brest to sign it, so shameful was it for them to do this. But meanwhile, they're making civil war. It's not a civil war imposed on them long before the Allied intervention. The Bolsheviks are creating civil war, and October is an explicit provocation for civil war. That is the whole point, a point, Alan, you have clearly missed. It is not a coup in the sense that this is the masses rising up and they needed no other force to seize power. The coup, which is what it was, and again, Trotsky tells us in his History of the Revolution it was a coup. We didn't need more than a few people to carry it out because there wasn't actually, as you've just said, a powerful regime for the Bolsheviks to overthrow. There was a vacuum of power. They picked up power from the streets. No one was going to defend Kerensky. But that coup was in itself a provocation. And that is why October was a tragedy. When I use the word tragedy, and the reason why I used it for the title of my book, is not simply because there were so many atrocities, so many millions of lives destroyed and wasted as a result of the October Revolution. It was because a tragedy, in the real dramatic sense, has to have had an alternative, a real alternative, that wasn't taken. And there was a real alternative, as late as the 25th of October 1917. Let's go through these details, because it's here, precisely, in this nitty-gritty of what happened in the Bolshevik Party Central Committee and in the Second Soviet Congress and all the Soviet meetings that had passed resolutions for Soviet power since the beginning of October, that this debate must hang. And I'm dumbfounded if Alan disagrees because a lot of his argument was based on precisely these details. Details, I'm afraid, he mystified and just got plain wrong. It is true that as, after the Kornilov uprising had been defeated by the Red Guards, by the uh, army that would, as Trotsky say, carry out October, there's a massive swing in the garrisons, in the factory towns, and even in some rural areas towards the idea of Soviet power. As Alan correctly says, Soviets are simply councils. They are mostly non-party organisations with a socialist leaning by the, uh, by, by, by the summer of 1917. They want Soviet power, but if you go into the archives and look at those mandates given to the delegates going to the Second Soviet Congress, they do not say they want Bolsheviks in power. They say they want Soviets in power. And they want all the socialist parties represented in the Soviet to be in power. It's not a vote for the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks did well in the City Duma elections of mid-September, but those aren't Soviet elections. All the Soviet mandates coming in to the capital and brought by delegates to the Second Soviet Congress say, yes, we want a transition of power to the Soviets. Not clear for which party. And insofar as there is any clarification, it is for a socialist coalition. Most of the Bolsheviks, in fact virtually all of the Bolsheviks, except Lenin, agree. Yes, you read my book but got it slightly wrong. You read other books but you got it wrong. The Bolsheviks, with the exception of Lenin, all agree that they should move towards Soviet power by the ballot box and by voting for Soviet power. That at the Second Soviet Congress, they should vote in by a resolution no more cooperation with the uh, uh, provisional government, with the liberals, a socialist government based on the Soviet. Now, the Bolshevik Party Central Committee, when it passed its resolution the 10th of October for, to put an insurrection on the agenda, did not have any plan to carry out an insurrection at that point. 
And indeed, there were many Bolsheviks who agreed with those who had voted against that resolution, namely Kamenev and Zinoviev, both Bolsheviks, that such an insurrection would be a catastrophe for the revolution. Because in their view, Soviet power, as Alan said in this dream of his, yes, it's true, uh, Soviet power should be democratic. That was their view. Not by coup, not by the violent overthrow of the existing government, which would, Kamenev and Zinoviev said, provoke civil war. They warned Lenin as late as the 18th of October when they were so cross with the way he was conducting party policy, pushing for a coup, pushing for a coup, knowing it would create civil war. They warned publicly, if the Bolsheviks seize power, there will be civil war and the Bolsheviks will only be able to remain in power by the use of mass terror. And they were right. On the 18th of October, Alan says the Bolshevik insurrection was based on the support of the masses. He's been watching too many of Eisenstein's propaganda films. On the 18th of October, the Bolsheviks meet again. Is it time for an insurrection? Do we have support for an insurrection? All the lieutenants from the garrisons, the factories, the Bolshevik military organisation in Petrograd, they all say basically the same thing. No, we do not have support for an insurrection. The masses as they call it, are impatient. They want Soviet power, but they're not going to come out on the call of the Bolshevik party. They will only come out if they think the revolution is in danger. And then only to defend the Soviet, i.e. the Second Soviet Congress, about to convene. So it looks fine for Kamenev and Zinoviev and Trotsky. Trotsky is late as the 24th of October. This was his position to put men on the street, not to seize power, but to defend the Soviet Congress against a potential counter-revolutionary threat. Let's think for a moment what would have happened if Trotsky, Kaninov, Zinoviev, and the, virtually everybody else except Lenin in the Bolshevik Party Central Committee had got their way, and the Congress had been allowed to pass a vote in favour of Soviet power. It was proposed by Mensheviks. Martov proposed the resolution. This is now late at night on the 20th of October. The resolution's passed. But what would happen? I tell you what would happen. This is one of the easiest what ifs of history. What would have happened is that a socialist coalition government based on representation in the Soviet would have been formed. There would have been a minor civil war like Kornilov again. Uh, the, the arms workers of Petrograd and the militarised, the militant elements of the garrison fighting against Cossacks and what other puny forces Kerensky could have mustered. It would have been over in a few days. There would then have been a socialist coalition government based on the Soviet Soviet power, but who would have been in control? It would have been. No doubt Kamenev and Zinoviev, the key players from the Bolsheviks. Martov, a key player from the Mensheviks. The left SR is playing a key role. Lenin and his maximalists wouldn't have been there. So Lenin calls, comes out of hiding, goes to the Smolny, the headquarters of the Bolsheviks, where the Soviet Congress is also going to meet, and grabs the party central committee by the scruff of the neck and forces through the insurrection. He's undoubtedly a great man for doing that. There are moments in history when great men make the difference, and he did. And from a position of armed defence, it doesn't take much, if you say the revolution's in danger, to go on to attack. And that's exactly what they did. And Trotsky comes around to Lenin's side. They go on to attack. They seize the strategic buildings. The... A seizure of the Winter Palace, which was just a house arrest. Alan's right. It's just there's no one to defend it anymore. The seizure of the Winter Palace is announced to the uh, Second Soviet Congress. And here, Sukhanov's memoirs are really important. He admits that they made the Mensheviks made the crucial mistake. They walked out of the Second Congress, giving victory to the Bolsheviks. Allowing Trotsky 
then to make his famous speech when the rest of the Mensheviks walk out saying, um, you know, go to the dustbin of history. They had given away the Soviet, the symbol of the revolution, the symbol of all those socialist aspirations of 1917. They had given them, they'd conceded them to the far left of the Bolshevik party. And actually, the anarchists and other maximalists who supported them at that point. Well, the consequences are civil war. Civil war begins on the 25th of October, because Kerensky is already summoning his forces. The Cossacks are already attacking. There's civil war in Moscow fighting for power. There's civil war in every provincial town. This isn't something imposed on the Bolsheviks. This is something Lenin must have known and explicitly in his own writings welcomes. You can't make a revolution without civil war. How could they have made... How, uh, uh, Alan asked, how could they have, how could they have uh, won the civil war? Being, how, how is it, unless they had mass support? Undoubtedly it's true that in fighting a civil war they were able to mobilise a large red army. They were able to uh, uh, divide the country between those who support the red flag and those who are supposedly against it. They can use nationalism. They do. They can create their planned economy, their terror system, their dictatorship of the proletariat, justifying every excess that they need to because it's the defence of the revolution. And they welcome that. They, they can explicitly welcome it. There's no bread. The spring of 1918, Trotsky announces the grain monopoly, the first and most important plank of war communism. And he's announcing what they're going to do. I've already told you. They send violent requisitioning squads into villages to take grain by force. And the remaining SRs, the most left-wing SRs in the Soviet Congress, say, but that's to make civil war. And Trotsky says, yes, of course. Long live civil war. We are for civil war. In other words, all of the atrocities, all of the excess deaths, all of the violence and terror is not just an unfortunate side effect of making this triumphant revolution. They are integral to it. They're the whole point of it. And Lenin and Trotsky spell it out from the beginning. It's only through civil war that you create state power. It's only through a dictatorship of the proletariat, which means giving you the right to kill anybody who's not of the proletariat, or lock them up, or send them into labour teams. Only through the dictatorship of the proletariat do you create a revolution. And Lenin took these ideas from Tkachev and Nechayev, and he was very explicit about it. Go and read your Lenin again, Alan, because it's there. And if you don't want it from his writings, look at it in his actions. And then look again at what he wrote in his last writings when he suddenly realises what a mess he's got on his hands. OK, I think I've said my bit. I've only taken 20 minutes. I've left. No, nope, I've, I've said my bit. I will um, allow you the floor and I'll allow the time for more questions. OK, I'll stop there. I came here to the, what, what is it, the Marxist? Marxist Student Federation. Student Federation, thank you. Expecting a hostile reception. What I didn't expect um, was to find so much ignorance. Because what I've heard from those who identify themselves consciously as Marxists and supporters of this motion is a legendary version of events which seems to have been taken mainly out of 10 days that shook the world, which is a very romantic, very persuasive, brilliantly written piece of propaganda. I haven't heard either from my co-speaker or from anybody on the floor any detailed, documented evidence to suggest that the motion should be supported. I will deal with some of these detail points, not all of them, because we don't have time in ten minutes. And then I want to say something finally about our friend from Ukraine. 
On uh, the question of Bolsheviks, pluralism, democracy, circa 1917, because a lot of the Marxists in the room seem to think that they were all synonymous. There was, it is true, as you've pointed out, there was, under Lenin and through the 1920s, a good deal of open debate. Under Lenin, no one got killed for their opinions. Only those who weren't Bolsheviks got killed for their opinions. But to imagine, as you also were asking us to do, that the Bolshevik party should be seen as a normal party, like any other, I think was your expression, is a complete fallacy. Because for Lenin, it wasn't a party. It was a military organisation for the seizure of power. And he said so many times. The Mensheviks actually didn't have a leader. You say all parties have leaders. The Mensheviks were very different as a Marxist party. And as Marxists, I suggest you look to them for your ancestry rather than the Bolshevik party because they were much more orthodox Marxists in that sense because they were truly democratic socialists. And they didn't have a leader. And the reason why they couldn't stand the Bolsheviks and split with them was because they realised the Bolsheviks was a party of Lenin. And that's why Trotsky hesitated so long to be in the party. And it was only the war, whoever mentioned the war, you're absolutely right, the war is the crucible of the Russian Revolution. Undoubtedly a mass slaughter. Undoubtedly one would want to see a protest movement against it. But Trotsky wouldn't join the Bolsheviks until that radicalising impact, because... He also didn't want to be in a party where the leader dictates all. And the ban on factions. You know, there was discussion in the party, but once you've banned the factions, which the party does in March 1921, it's impossible to oppose the leadership without being accused of factionalism. And that's what happened to Trotsky. It's what happened to Kamenev and Zinoviev. Effectively, it's what happened to Bukharin, and that is why the Bolshevik party was not ultimately democratic. <coughs> Nor was there much pluralism within this rough, fragile alliance, uh, alliance that uh, agreed to support Soviet power between October and the uh, July 1918 SR, SR uprising. The Vic Gel talks, you mentioned too, I'm sorry, but go back to the books and have a look at what happened. Because Kamenev, as chairman of the, of the executive of the Soviet after October the 25th, supported the Vic Gel talks, wanted the Bolsheviks to talk with Vic Gel. Vic Gel was the railwayman's union. The Bolsheviks were fighting the first stage of the civil war already, trying to seize power in Moscow against SR... And, and just general democratic resistance. And the railway was absolutely key to this, because if they can't use the railway, they, can't, they don't have a hope. And the Railwaymen's Union, which was made up of Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, SRs, the whole lot, they uh, wanted to use what leverage they had to try to force the Bolsheviks back to the negotiating table to form a socialist coalition. Lenin went along with it, but only until the uh, civil war swung in his favour in Moscow, at which point, I'm sorry, he arrests the Vic Gel leaders. <coughs> the Constituent Assembly elections have been referred to. Absolutely right. Um, somebody uh, uh, from Russia, a friend from Russia, said absolutely right. They didn't like the result, so they closed down the Assembly. Arguably... The Constituent Assembly was a higher form of democratic representation than the Soviets because only those who call themselves the proletariat have a vote in the Soviet, whereas every adult has a vote in the Constituent Assembly. And there were Bolsheviks, many Bolsheviks, in the Central Committee, including Kamenev and Zinoviev, who wanted to somehow square Soviet power with the Constituent Assembly. They genuinely thought that if they moved towards a socialist coalition, that might happen. If not this time in the Constituent Assembly elections, then later on. 
But Lenin wasn't prepared for coalition with the other socialist parties. And in closing the Constituent Assembly, he took another giant step, a deliberate step towards civil war. Because those who joined the Kamuch, the Committee for the Defence of the Constituent Assembly, and found in the Czechs the first real force that might resist Bolshevik power, were fighting for the restoration of the Constituent Assembly. That's why SRs and Mensheviks found themselves in the anti-Bolshevik camp. For the restoration of democracy. You asked a very good question about the mandates of the Soviet Assembly. We don't know about the mandates. The mandates don't say, I've looked at the mandates. They don't say what they want. It's not clear. There's no clear answer to this. All we know is that the Bolsheviks had probably a majority in the Congress, but not necessarily a majority would have voted for, um, the, uh, for, for, for a Bolshevik, uh, for Sovnarkom's power, if they knew what it was going to be. We just don't know. All we can say for sure is that the vast majority of the mandates coming to the Soviet Congress supported Soviet power. That's all we can say. But it's a mistake to assume that, the, as I think you or somebody else said, that the Bolsheviks represented the Soviets. They didn't. They used the Soviets that by claiming so Soviet power to legitimise their dictatorship. And within days, in fact within hours of seizing power in the name of Soviet, the Soviets, they were ruling regardless of the Soviet Assembly and regardless of the Soviet executive, where they had their own chairman, Kamenev. They were ruling through Sovnarkom, the, the uh, Council of People's Commissars, which had one left SR in it and was otherwise the organising executive of the Bolshevik dictatorship. The Soviet Assembly wasn't allowed to meet for weeks. And in the interim, Sovnarkom established the death penalty, endorsed the Cheka, declared an armistice, outlawed uh, uh, the uh, opposition press. How can, you have, how can you even speak of pluralism and democracy when on the 4th of November, Sovnarkom has banned all non-Bolshevik newspapers? You need to get off of your fantasies based on ideology and the, the romantic propaganda of ten days that shook the world. Get off it. <laughs> there has been some talk from those who I suspect will oppose this motion about the legacies, the true legacies of the October Revolution, which... Some of our speakers from the floor who have lived through it have pointed out. But we've had silence, virtual silence, and apology, and even implicit justification, implicit justification of all that terror and violence that took place in the 1930s, 1940s, it didn't stop in the 1940s, by the way. Deportations of peoples was continuing at the end of the war. Lithuanians, captured by the Red Army at the end of the war, were sent to the Gulags because they couldn't be trusted. So, yeah, I will finish. Finally, I just want to come, because I, I have interjected, I've come here in good faith, but there's some things I've heard which just make my blood boil. And I think, I think that what you have said, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, you didn't announce your name, or I didn't hear it. Aaron. Aaron. What Aaron said is absolutely shameful. People have stood up in this hall and talked about what happened to their families. And you refer to them as random anecdotes. Are we to say that the, the wasted and destroyed lives of how many millions we will never know, but undoubtedly more than 30 million? Undoubtedly. Five times as many victims of the Jewish Holocaust. 
Think about it. Are you to say that people who stand up and talk about what happened to their family should be dismissed because it's inconvenient to your ideology as random anecdotes? I'm sorry, that makes me cross. Well, I will not start by describing my opponent either as ignorant or even brainwashed, you know. I think that we've listened to him with respect, a little bit more respect than what was perhaps shown yeah, yeah. to us, but never mind, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Uh, we, we are big boys and girls, so we can put up with these things. Now, some important points were raised in the course of the discussion. Unfortunately, we don't have sufficient time to go into them. But first of all, in relation to the, the, the main mistake, if I can call it that, is an insidious, and that is shameful, and that does make me cross, an insidious attempt to identify in some way the crimes of Stalinism with the clean and spotless banner of the proletarian revolution of 1970. That is shameful, profoundly shameful, and profoundly wrong. Let me prove it just with one sentence, it's enough. By the way, somebody asked me, do I approve of the massacre of millions of peasants and Stalin's, Stalin's forced collectivism? Of course not. I do not approve. I have never approved and I never will approve. We've condemned it consistently. But what you're talking about here, my friend, is not Bolshevism, not Marxism, but the crimes of Stalinism, which is an entirely different beast. And the attempt, the insidious, the disgraceful attempt, to try in some way to, in to insinuate, oh, this comes from Lenin. This is the fault of Lenin, because the Bolsheviks were not democratic. I mean, that does make me cross. Somebody asked me about sources. My dear friend, I spent 30-odd years studying original sources. If you care to come, if you care to come to my house, I will show them some of them to you. In any case, in any, in any case, in any case, read, please. I, I'll return the question. Please read the books I've got in my house, the minutes of the Bolshevik Party Congress is going throughout history, and what you will find, to your surprise, is that Lenin's party was actually the most democratic party in history. There's never been a more democratic party in which ideas were freely expressed and debated and nobody was repressed. It's a damned lie, and a shameful lie, as Orlando ought to know. It was a very democratic, and the regime established by the Bolsheviks was a very democratic regime indeed, in 1970, at the beginning. Now, the question which must be answered is how did it degenerate? How did Stalinism arise out of this situation? But let me na nail this appalling lie, let me, let me nail it firmly on the head, that in some sense, Stalin is the product of Lenin, and Stalinism and all its horrors are the product of Leninism. That is entirely false. Let me prove it to you. Just one sentence will suffice. If it were true, which it is not, <coughs> if it were true that Leninism comes from Bolshevism, you have to answer me one question. How does it come about that Stalin who rose on the dead bones of the Bolshevik party and the Bolshevik revolution. How is it that Stalin, in order to consolidate his, his uh, monstrous, bureaucratic, tyr tyrannical and totalitarian regime, had to slaughter physically every single one of the leaders of Lenin's party? Why is that the case? If they're the same, that shouldn't be necessary. Of course they're not the same. That's absolute nonsense. Now you'll excuse me for being, being a bit emotional, but we should perhaps take the heat out and let's, let's have a little bit of light on this discussion. Stalin only succeeded for one reason. And by the answer was, the answer was, given by, is it Jason? Who that asked that very interesting question? Justin, yes, Justin. Very interesting. He said, well, didn't Marx say that the revolution, the socialist revolution would begin in an advanced capitalist country, not a backward country like Russia. Absolutely correct, Justin. Absolutely correct. Marxism, which is scientific uh, socialism, is based on the conception that socialism is not just a good idea. It must have a material base. 
in the development of the productive forces such that people don't have to struggle for a crust of bread, people don't have to struggle for the, the means of existence. The, the, the means of production must be developed at least, shall we say, to the level it is in Britain, or in America, or in Japan. The, cult the cultural question is also the same. You know, without that, it's utopian to talk about sources. Okay? But the question is this. Why, why was, was Lenin therefore wrong to take power? Why did the Bolsheviks take power in the backward country? Weren't the Mensheviks right, as Orlando seemed to, to think? No. The Bolsheviks took power because they had to take power. And if they had not taken power in November 1970, despite what Orlando says, what would the alternative have been? A nice, bourgeois, liberal regime? No. The alternative was clear. It was Kornilov. It was the white generals who conducted a really uh, staggering campaign of slaughter, massacre, rape, violence, all kinds of Asiatic uh, monstrosity against the peasants precisely. And the reason, the only reason, it's not a coup, that's just that argument falls, I'm sorry, it falls by, uh, by, by, its, prop, by its own weight. The reason why the, the Bolsheviks could retain power, the only reason, the main reason at least, is that the peasants saw that the white generals, if they came back, would mean, not as somebody said, the restoration of Tsarism. No, 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 no. Far worse than that. If these white generals, these monsters, would have, would have taken power, and by the way, the SRs and Mensheviks played absolutely no independent role. They joined the whites, Orlando. They joined the way they joined white governments in Samara and other areas. You know this. Incidentally, let's make one point clear on this question of violence. Look, I hope you believe me when I say that I am not a violent person. I stand, oh yes, I stand, we stand for the sources transformation of society in Britain and internationally. We would be delighted to have a peaceful transition to the socialist movement. We're not going to provoke civil war. We don't want violence. Yes, but. Yes, but. I have read a little bit of history, not just of Russia, but general history. And what my reading of history, because I'm also a realist, what it tells me is this, Orlando, that no ruling class or elite in history has ever surrendered its power and wealth and privileges without a fight. Okay? And therefore... If you're serious about changing society, we must take that into consideration. That's proven in Russia. You say, oh, but the Bolsheviks provoked the civil war. How did they provoke civil war? They provoked civil war by taking power, by, by, taking the, by, the, by, by passing power to the Soviets, precisely. Precisely. Oh, it was a party. Yes, it was a party. The only party that was in favor of Soviets, the Soviets taking power. Because the Mensheviks were not in favor, despite what you say. The SRs also were not in favor. So where do we stand? They were expressing, whether you like it or not, they were expressing the democratic will of millions of people, of the majority of the Russian people. Yes, I'm adamant on this question. And they were the majority of the Soviets. Precisely that's why they delayed the seizure of power until the Soviet Congress, where they had a clear majority. Democratic, yes, uh, of course it's democratic. Somebody asked about the Constituent Assembly. Well, you disappointed me in your reply, Orlando, because I thought you'd answer that point. Because your, your book deals with it rather well. The Constituent Assembly elections were held uh, by the Bolsheviks, by the way, after the revolution, on the basis of old census, an old electoral antiquated census drawn up previously, in which the SR party, yes, the mass party of the peasantry it was, and in, in the meantime, it split into two halves. And the majority, the lefts, came over to the Bolsheviks. The original Soviet government was not a Bolshevik government. It was a coalition of Bolsheviks and left SRs. The great majority of the peasants supported the left SRs, not the right-wing SRs of Chernoff, who were in the Constituent Assembly. Who, by the way, if they'd have been left to their own devices, would have returned the power to the landlords and capitalists, which had just been overthrown through the efforts of the workers, which was, was not to be permitted. Now, let Orlando answer this point, because he does it rather well. I must say something good about you, otherwise you think I'm hostile. <laughs> Where's your book? Where's your quote? Here you are. Here he says, the village Soviets, the village Soviets, were much closer to the political ideals of the mass of the peasants than the constituent assembly, being, in effect, no more than their own village assemblies in the more revolutionary form. Correct. 
I breathe a lot, but it's rather a lot. Let's pick another example. Listen. Virtually all the resolutions from the villages, from the villages, from the peasants, listen to what I'm saying, from the peasants on this question, on this question, made it clear that they did not want the assembly. This is Orlando Fajas speaking. How do you pronounce your name? Fajas. I beg your pardon. Virtually, I'll repeat, in case, you, in case you didn't hear, I'll repeat it. Virtually all the resolutions from the villages on this question made it clear that they did not want the assembly to be restored as the political master of the Russian land, in the words of one, the highest authority, higher, higher authority than the local Soviets. One, one other word on this nonsense about the constituent assembly. From a good source, from one of the leaders of the right SRs, Boris Solokov, who writes the following. I more than once had occasion to hear the soldiers, sometimes even the most intelligent of them, object to the Constituent Assembly. To most of them, it was associated with the State Duma, an institution that was remote from them. What, quote, what do we need some Constituent Assembly for when we already have our Soviets? This is the peasantry speaking, quoted by one of the leaders of the SRs, where our own deputies can meet and decide everything. Therefore, all this hullabaloo about the Constituent Assembly, same as all the other hullabaloo, is just so much bunk. Which, is, which certainly is not historical and not one. Now, just to finish, I had the figures here. I <laughs> don't have time. Einstein says the time is relative, but it's not my experience. <laughs> for us, for us it, is, it is absolute. But frankly, I'll, I'll tell you something. You see, this, the, the crimes of Stalinism, of course, that's got nothing to do, that's a counter revolution. Stalinist counter revolution, nothing to do with Marxism or with Leninism or, or with Bolshevism. Nevertheless, despite that, we must not overlook the fact, and by the way, Orlando, I've, I've spoken to many people in Russia, in Poland, in Slovakia, in the, you know what they say, many people? You know, this is hopeless, this bloody mess we've got in Armenia is in a war. But that wasn't the case be, be, before. As a, Azeris and Armenians slaughtering each other, Jordan in, in a mess, the whole damn thing is in a mess. After the restoration of capitalism in Russia, you had the biggest collapse of the productive forces of any country in history, 60% collapse. It's monstrous, the position that exists in Russia now, under this marvelous market economy which you're so fond of. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend. I have a man who comes to my house. He's a plumber. He's Ukrainian. He's working as a plumber. This man in the Soviet Union made industrial robots for, for Sputniks, for spaceships. He's now forced to come here because he can't find work in his own country, like a lot of people who were enslaved, not privileged students, we beg my pardon, but workers, plumbers, bricklayers, carpenters, brutally exploited. And frankly, a lot of people, not just one or two, a lot of say to me the following, well, frankly, we were better off before. At least I had a house, at least I had a job, at least I had, of course, they didn't want the secret police or the bureaucracy any more than, than we do. But I'll say this to you. Most of the workers, I'm firmly convinced, in the Ukraine, in Russia, and, he's, and if, they, if they were at this meeting, they would agree with me, I'm certain, would say this. Well, look, we, socialism's a good idea. Not a dream, Orlando. An absolute necessity. It's a good idea. But what we really require is socialism, yes, but with democracy, with free speech, without the bureaucracy, without the dictatorship. Comrade Chairman and friends, this is our program. That is the program of Marxism. That's what we defend. We invite you to assist us in, in continuing not just the discussion, but continuing the fight for the only cause which is worthwhile at the beginning of the 21st century, the cause for the struggle for the emancipation of the working class in Britain, in Europe, in Russia, the Ukraine, and everywhere. Thank you.